Thanks for joining everyone. I'm just gonna give people a few more minutes to funnel in. So sit tight and we'll get started soon. Hi everyone, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Ali Fisher and I am the Wildlife and Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Associate for Oregon Wild. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce our guest, Dr. Alexa Main. Main is a muscle and lamprey biologist and the lead biologist for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservations Freshwater Mussel Research and Restoration Project. I would also like to include a land acknowledgement in this space. I would like to offer gratitude for the land itself and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I would like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous peoples on the land today, like the Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla tribes who make up the Confederated tribes of the Umatilla. However, it must be noted that this brief acknowledgement can in no way capture the vast complexity and nuance that surrounds the history of tribes the history between them and the federal government and individual states, as well as historical events, including colonial legacies and wrongdoings like forced removal that have had long lasting and current impacts. That being said, the most important thing to do is to not only acknowledge indigenous people and the land, but continue to do meaningful work by supporting them in the present, respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty, doing your research and taking action. You can learn more about the Confederate tribes in the Umatilla Indian Reservation um, by following this website below, www.ctuir.org. Additionally, a recording of this program will be emailed out tomorrow and will be posted on our website, OregonWild.org, in the Wild blog. Please do enter your questions at any time in the Q&A. We usually do get a flood of questions right at the end of the presentation. So the sooner you can get yours in, the easier it will be for me to organize and then, and then ask them at the end. And now I will pass it off to Alexa. Thank you. Let me share my screen.
Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. I really appreciate it. Appreciate being invited to speak tonight and all of you for listening in. Um, so I'm Alexa Main. I'm the project leader for the CTUIR Freshwater Muscle Project. And I want to acknowledge my partners on the project, my team members, Donna Nez, a field technician for us, and Tila Brandstetter in the laboratory. And then we have a consultant, longtime consultant, Christine O'Brien, who's helped with the project a lot. And the project's been around quite a long time, one of the longest running freshwater muscle projects in the Western US, perhaps the longest running. And we're funded by Bonneville Power Administration's Fish and Wildlife Program. So I'll talk today about freshwater mussels. What are they? What does our project do specifically? Um, and more into our research and restoration components of our project. Um, I'll talk about why the CTUIR is interested in mussels, why mussels are important to tribal people and to the river community in general. And I'll talk about where we work. I'll show some of our our current work, some um, presence and absence data that we have for freshwater mussels. I'll talk a little bit about our field work. And then I'll get a little bit into how we do our research, our restoration, and a brand new freshwater mussel master supplementation plan that we finished in 2021. So what are mussels? They are an animal. Some people might be surprised to hear that. A lot of people think of them as just a little rock in the river. Um, and they do kind of look like rocks, you can see from this little image, but they are in fact animals. And they have incredibly complex life cycles, which include using a fish to host their larvae. They are highly imperiled worldwide and especially in the Western US. And we have a potential endangered listing coming for one of the species in the West. They are a cultural and traditional resource for tribal members and indigenous people from the Columbia Columbia Basin, Columbia Plateau. And there's a huge lack of knowledge for all mussels worldwide, but especially in the Western US, we have fewer species than those in the, the Midwest and the Eastern US. And so we know very little about our mussels. And what we do know suggests that they are environmental indicators. They can identify good water quality. They can identify stable substrates where mussels are persisting. Um, and they are good sentinels in the river. So muscle or not a muscle, there's some confusion sometimes. Um, I hear a lot of negative connotations about the word muscle associated with a zebra or quagga muscle, dracenid muscles, which you see in the middle here. And those are invasive muscles. They are not native to this area and they have a different life cycle than a native freshwater mussel. So you can see in the green on the far right, the native freshwater mussels use a fish to host their larvae and they require that fish host for their life cycle. And these two other invasive mussels, the Asian clam and the zebra or quagga mussels don't require a host, are much more successful at reproduction and invading different areas. Um, but big distinction between the two species, the three species. So our freshwater mussel research and restoration project has um, seven research arms and one restoration arm. And it started in 2002, like I said, our first field season was in 2003. We have only two full-time staff, one half-time person, which we share with Lamprey in the laboratory for the artificial propagation portion of the project. And we generally hire two to four seasonal technicians per year to help us with some of that field work but it's a very small crew doing all this research and all this restoration. So our project kind of aligns into three priority areas. We wanna understand through research what the current and future risks of freshwater mussels will be. And we wanna protect and conserve the existing mussel populations that we do have and uh, monitor those so that we know how their health is. We can track population trends over time. And then finally, this is kind of a, an ambitious um, priority area, priority area C, the restoration of impaired or extirpated populations and mussel habitat and doing that all through adaptive management. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a really big ask that priority area C, but we're moving the project from a more research-based, what are mussels, what do they do in the river 
understand their biology and ecology, what their host fish are. We're moving that into a restoration phase. We still have a lot to learn in the research phase, but mussels are declining so rapidly that we really need to focus on restoration while we're also trying to discover new things about freshwater mussels on the research end. And the entire goal of the project is to restore self-sustaining populations of freshwater mussels to seeded areas of the CTUIR. So a self-sustaining population, you can kind of see in this little photo in the background that um, there's lots of mussels in this photo. So that would be what we would consider a self-sustaining bed where the reproduction rate equals or is, is greater than the mortality rate of the population. And unfortunately, there are very few self-sustaining populations in seeded areas that we've identified. So this goal is fairly lofty, but it is a goal that we keep in mind for all of our research and restoration work. So I'll just talk about the three main types of mussels that we study. There's two species and then one genera, which covers um, any number of possible species. The taxonomy is a little bit messed up for that, that genus, but this is Margotripper falcata, the Western pearl shell. This is the longest lived mussel in the Western US, can live up to 100 years or more in some cases. They use salmonid fishes as their fish host exclusively. So they're a specialist, which makes them a little bit less adaptable if their fish host starts to decline as well. And they can form really dense beds. That's the mussel that you see in this picture behind my head. They can form beds of 10,000 or more mussels. And uh, we generally ID freshwater mussels using their papillae, which are these little, um, appendages right here off the mantle tissue of the mussel. So those are different per species. We use those when we're snorkeling. I have a couple pictures for you to kind of see that. The Western Ridge mussel has been kind of highlighted in the news lately because it's been petitioned for a listing as endangered by the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. So this is another long lived mussel, 30 to 60 or more years. Um, it is also a specialist, so it uses exclusively members of the sculpin family, and it's generally more cryptic than the other mussels. It does not form these dense beds that you'll see for the western pearl shell. It um, is declining fairly rapidly in many places that we're observing, and we've observed several populations that are no longer reproductive, even though they are of reproductive age. So there's a lot of things going on with this particular mussel that we're really unsure of. And that has led to this petition for listing as endangered. And then this is the freshwater mussel, the floater group. We call them the anodonta mussels. Um, there are multiple potential species here, um, previously identified as about six different species. It's been split a couple times, reorganized in taxonomy. Um, but these guys, as a group, generally are shorter lived, live about 10 to 20 maybe 30 years at most. They're a generalist, so they use a wide variety of host fishes, which might make them a little bit more adaptable. They also have a wider distribution than the other two species that we work with. And um, the issue, the main issue with taxonomy is that the shells look very similar from place to place, or that um, the shell of the same actual genetic species looks different from place to place because the shell is fairly plastic to the environment. So these mussels are um, generally a little bit more hardy, live a little bit lower in a system, can tolerate a little bit more pollution, a little bit of sedimentation like you see in this picture um, compared to the other two species. So just the general life cycle of the mussel, this is specific to the anodonta group and they are, um, they, they, yeah, I'll just go through the life cycle. So we have male and female mussels in the river. And the female siphons in sperm from the water column, internally fertilizes those larvae, which are called glochidia. And they're about the size of a grain of sand, about um, 40 to 300 microns in size, depending on the species. And those glochidia find a fish. And that happens in a number of different ways, depending on the mussel species and their target host fish. So for this one in particular, in this image, this is the anodonta group, the floater mussels. And so these guys attach to the fins of the fish. So the female mussel will release these larvae, these glochidia in the sticky web and a fish swims through or near it. And those little tiny larvae attach to the fins of the fish. They develop on the fish uh, into juvenile mussels and then drop off the fish 
those triggers are kind of unknown to us still. Those young, tiny muscles will vary in the substrate and then grow and become adults and start the cycle over again. So a lot of what I study is reproductive biology. I look at these associations between muscle species and fish species, which hosts are the best for which muscle species, and how can we use that in the laboratory to grow more muscles. So you can kind of see from these two images how tiny muscle uh, larvae really are. So it's technically a parasitic relationship. However, the parasitism is very low in terms of what that muscle larvae is taking from the fish. And the, um, the number of muscle larvae that actually attach to a fish in the wild is very, very low, two to 10 individual larvae on a fish generally. So again, we have two specialist species, the Margaritifera specialist on Salmonids. You can kind of interpret that there are some issues there. And then the Ganidia angulata, the Western Ridge Mussel petitioned for endangered status is a specialist on Sculpin. And that's this mussel over here on, with this blue background. You can see these little white chunks that have appeared to come out of the mussel. Those are actually packets of tightly um, woven uh, larvae called conglutinates. And so for that particular mussel, Ganidia, the western ridge mussel, it's targeting a sculpin. And so it might expel those little packets out and attract that sculpin, which is interested in something that's moving across its plane of view. And so that sculpin will eat that packet of muscle larvae, realize it's not a food item, flush it out the gills, and that's where those two specialist species are attaching their larvae on the gill filaments of those fishes. And then we have the generalist group, the Anodonta. You can see they use a wide variety of fishes. However, there's some asterisks on those fish, and hopefully you've picked out those are the non-native fish in the group. And so those non-native fishes um, a, a wide variety of non-native fishes. What we found, um, the bottom uh, publication that's in press right now is a, a look at native versus non-native host use for that particular mussel group. And we found that while um, those anodonta larvae do transform into juveniles on those non-native fishes, they do so at a much, much lower rate. And the likelihood of that happening outside of the laboratory is, is very low or none. So those non-native fishes are, are not good hosts and um, their behavior, they eat some juvenile mussels, they have a, a wide variety of negative implications for freshwater mussels. So an important point here is that this is the primary method, mussels on fish is the primary method that mussels move up or downstream. So mussels, um, several of them are very long lived, they live multiple decades, they want to be buried in the sediment for those decades and not be disturbed. And so they're not moving horizontally across a river system. They're moving vertically up and down, burrowing into substrate deeper or shallower. And so the primary method of transportation is on fish as larvae dropping off as juveniles in a new area. So again, these are the three species and we look very closely at these papillae. Um, each of these muscles, you can see an X current siphon with, with very smooth tissue. And these are the identifying um, pieces right here called papillae. And for this Margotifera, looks kind of arborescent tree-like. It's very chunky. There's not very well-defined margins here. And then we go over to this right-hand side, the Ganidia angulata, western ridge muscle. Again, the X current siphon looks very similar in all species, very smooth tissue here. That's where water's being expelled out. And then these papillae are kind of um, bifid, two-pronged, and they have fairly well-defined margins here. And then down here for the anodonta, they're teeth-like, they've got singular um, papillae, and again, that smooth tissue for the X-current siphon there. Just some images of mussels underwater. Um, some are very cryptic. This image is gonna come up later. I'm gonna ask how many mussels are in this picture. This is just a sneak peek here. But there's multiple species in this picture and there's more mussels than you think. They um, look kind of cryptic here and they're hard to see, two different species highlighted there. And then we can see a large group. These are the Western pearl shell. They're very similar to the ones in the background of my um, picture behind my head. These guys are the ones that form very dense beds. You can see they're all kind of oriented the same way. It's likely into the flow of the river so that they can take in those materials. 
um, do their filtration, close up of some muscles. So why do we care about muscles? Um, I work for the CTUIR. The freshwater mussel is a, considered a first food, a food of significant cultural, historic, um, ecological importance to the tribes. They have a, a very strong connection to the river community. They're cleaning and filtering water. They're stabilizing or indicating stable substrates, cycling nutrients from the open water area to the benthic zone, which thereby increases macroinvertebrate populations. And they are vulnerable, near threatened, or potentially endangered, as I've said. So just another look at the first foods. So um, the first foods of the CTYR are organized into these five categories, water being the most important on which everything relies. And then we see salmon as a category of foods. So salmon is kind of a traditional food. All of these different organisms that are listed under salmon have been used historically and currently as first foods for tribal members. And you can see up here in the left top left image, here's some um, boiled and dried muscle tissue that's hung on strings. That was a traditional way of preparing and eating those foods. And then down here, mussels are also used for their shell material. This is called a wampum necklace, punched um, out of mussel shells. You can see varying thicknesses, which are probably related to various species of mussel that were used. And these necklaces, you can see in a lot of historical photos, people using those mussel shells for adornment and jewelry. <clears throat> and this is a seasonal round. You can kind of uh, see where different foods under that first foods um, alignment are harvested at different times of year. So mussels were generally harvested in the fall, boiled, dried, or treated in other ways so that they were consumed over the winter when other foods were generally scarce. So under this first foods management style, we implement something called the river vision, which is the idea that a, a watershed can provide all of these first foods in abundance for the people from now until um, time immemorial for forever. And so under this river vision, we think about water and fish and these five different touchstones, hydrology, geomorphology, connectivity, riparian vegetation, and biota. And I work primarily because of freshwater mussels in this biota touchstone. And you can see the restoration for those biota, um, any of the salmon or trout or lamprey or freshwater mussels. We're doing some propagation or hatchery rearing and then outplanting those individuals. And for salmonid and other fish species that are relatively better studied compared to mussels, they're monitoring juvenile sur survival and abundance. We're not quite there yet with freshwater mussels, so we're still trying to understand the abundance and distribution in the seeded area. We're understanding survival just as a general category. And then what we really are interested in is that reproduction or recruitment and understanding um, the levels of reproduction versus the levels of mortality that we're seeing in some of our monitored populations. So mussels are um, the Brita filter of the river. They're doing these services that we don't even know, we don't even thank them for. Um, they generally fall under these four categories, filtration of water, which includes cycling or capturing nutrients or removing pollutants, storing those in their tissue or their shell, um, increasing habitat. So um, macroinvertebrates or periphyton or bacteria grow on the actual shell of the mussels, which increases the complexity of the benthic zone. Mussels serve as food for mammals, for um, other aquatic species, for birds, at all various parts of their life cycle. And then they also increase the growth and production of other aquatic species, especially macroinvertebrates, but also organisms like larval lamprey, which are also filter feeders. So mussels are kind of doing those services um, at the benthic zone. And we can see from this image, again, these are just those services I just mentioned, biofiltration, taking in water, um, removing pollutants, storing those in their tissues, exporting clean water, cycling nutrients from fish waste and other particulate matter, and storing that in their tissues or putting that in the benthic zone for other organisms to eat, um, reducing the particulate matter in the water column, reducing the number of contaminants or pathogens in the water column. There's been many studies showing that for all sorts of mollusk species. 
and connecting different portions of the food web, um, especially to support macroinvertebrate and microbial communities. Again, their shells are substrate for other organisms and they're cycling and depositing nutrients from the water column into the benthic zone, um, which is an indirect connection between those two different communities of the river system. Mussels are really kind of at that interface of the benthic and open water zones. So mussels I mentioned are um, imperiled in many different ways. We have one species, the Western Ridge mussel, Ganidia angulata, which is petitioned for listing as endangered. You can see some complications with freshwater mussels from just this one table. Um, these are long lived species. And so these two particular mussels, the Western Ridge mussel, Ganidia, and the Western Pearl shell, Margaritifera, have huge generation lengths. So these are, are long-lived species, takes them a long time to become reproductive, and they're reproducing at a very low rate. And so it, it really is very difficult when, um, when you have that complication in addition to several other complications that mussels are facing. So we can also see this is the change in extent of occurrence and the change in watershed area for each of these species all across the board have declined. It's very bad. Um, because of this, uh, we updated the IUCN red list categories for, for, for all the Western mussel species. Um, all of them have been, are at least vulnerable. Some are, are least concerned, but they've been updated. And because of some of this work, Anidia angulata was then petitioned for listing. However, I'd like to call your attention to two other species, Anodonta nataliana, uh, which is one of the floater species, and Margaritifera falcata, which were also updated as vulnerable or near threatened. So just because Ganidia angulata has been petitioned for listing doesn't mean all the rest of the mussel species are okay. We potentially could see more listings in the future. Definitely there needs to be more conservation awareness about these uh, all Western mussel species. So where do they exist? I guess it's not in the world. Where do they exist in the Western US? So in the world, in, in North America, we have um, about 290 plus species uh, from the continental divide east. And over here, west of the continental divide, we have a very limited number of species. So we have five species in the western part of North America, four species in our CTYR seeded territory. And so a limited number compared to those in the east, which is part of the reason why we have a lot of um, blank spaces in our distribution map here and why uh, freshwater mussels are relatively unstudied compared to other organisms. So we've, we've seen, we've observed and recorded range-wide declines for all of these mussel species. Um, and you can see again, a lot of uncovered territory. We, we have a lot of unknowns in our data, partly because there's not a lot of people working on freshwater mussels. For the C2IR specifically, these are C2IR survey points only. So there, there are quite a few more survey points that could be added to this map from other groups, but this just captures the effort by C2IR which has done probably the most freshwater mussel work in the West as a collective group. And you can kind of see the distribution of mussels, a lot of X's, which means no mussels were found there. A lot of those sites that have no mussels observed were sites where historically mussels had been recorded. So we're seeing declines across the area. You can also see a, a large um, chunks of, of river that are unsurveyed, which is just a, due to the complexity of surveying for mussels, which I'll talk about soon. So we do some status and distribution monitoring at a lot of long-term monitoring sites, which is shown here on, on this graph. You can see a steep decline um, around 2012 for this particular, one of those particular sites. Um, annually, we're surveying multiple sites per year, as many as we can get to with such a small crew. We're starting to use eDNA sampling to really help us identify um, potential presence and absence so that we're not just picking a point on a map and going to to snorkel survey for that. We're developing some habitat suitability modeling um, with some of our habitat and distribution data. We have these long-term monitoring sites like that you can see here. This is one which shows decrease and then you know, some increasing, decreasing year after year. We have others that are increasing. We don't yet understand why that's happening, why, why populations are increasing in one area and decreasing in another. We're trying to collect a lot of data to try to understand these population trends that we're seeing. And unfortunately, and this is a reason that, that Ganidia angulata, the Western Ridge mussel has been petitioned for listing, it has undergone significant die-offs across its range. And this 
image, which I understand if you're not a muscle person, it's hard to understand what's happening here, but these are, are shells of mussels that died in situ during a mass die-off event in the, in the middle fork of the John Day River in the mid 2000s. So this was a very dense population of Ganidia and they appeared to be healthy, reproductive, and for whatever reason, unknown causes, the entire population crashed and went from 500 mussels per square meter to zero mussels per square meter for about a quarter mile of river. So I'll just kind of fly through some of these um, subbasin maps. These are the five main subbasins that we work in. You can see from this Umatilla uh, map that there's a ton of, of X's, no mussels were observed here. And so most of the main stem Umatilla River is void of mussels. And that is not historically what was observed. There was tons of mussels in the Umatilla. We have shell midden data, we have archeological data, we have oral histories from elders that show us that. So there's, there's been a lot of changes in this basin and this is a focus for us for restoration particularly. And the same for these other sub basins, a lot of um, negative sites where we did not observe mussels and a lot of unsurveyed area that you can see from these sites. So we've got a lot of tributaries and main stem river miles that are unsurveyed. We don't really know the mussel resources that we have to the fullest extent that we would like to. And part of that is just because it is very difficult to survey for mussels. A big focus of ours has been the John Day Basin. Um, historically, it had all three mussel genera in abundance um, in most locations that we observe. That's not been the case. Uh, we've had populations trending downward, declining year after year in our long-term monitoring sites, many of which are in the North Fork and the Middle Fork of the John Day. But you can see we've done quite a bit more surveying in these areas, partly due to access and partly due to the fact that we find mussels there. And so we focus on this area for um, things like broodstock collection, um, collecting female mussels to bring back to the laboratory to do propagation in the lab to try to move into the restoration phase of our project. The Toucanon Basin has mainly Margaritifera, but there's a lot of unsurveyed river miles that we can get to at some point. <clears throat> so where would we go to find mussels? Mussels need generally these four categories of um, habitat features. And these are a little bit squishy of categories. There's a lot of um, controversy in describing these. Um, it's very hard to say where you could specifically find a mussel in a river. It, oftentimes it changes river to river or species to species. But generally, because mussels are long lived, they're sedentary, they're not moving, they need stability. And that might mean a variety of things. Um, so they need a place where they're not going to get washed away in a flood. They need a place where they can kind of find refuge from low flow in the summer during drought, um, things like that. They need diversity of structure so that it captures some of their food items, some algae, diatoms, bacteria. They need burrowing material. I said mussels don't move horizontally up and down the river. Um, that's not quite what they're meant to do, but they can burrow deep to avoid things like hot temperatures, low temperatures, flooding, uh, things like that. And then the most important, in my opinion, being a reproductive biology specialist for mussels is the host fish. So in that little image right over here, you can see a salmonid and their, um, the mussel that uses exclusively that type of fish, Margaritifera. Without the host fish, there is no reproduction. There's no possibility of reproduction. So the host fish aspect is very important. We've done quite a bit of research to determine some of these variables um, regarding habitat suitability, where, where can we expect to find mussels? And um, really what this flow chart shows is that we eliminate very few river miles where we, where we know we don't have to look for mussels. Um, but again, generally we're looking for those four features, stability, diversity, burrowing material, and host fish. And uh, when we talk about restoration of mussel habitat, those four pieces need to be provided and we need to protect where mussels exist. We need to protect those features that are working that cause mussels to congregate and survive for decades at a time. So the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation has produced some really great publications that um, talk about how to plan for mussels and restoration, um, looking for mussels, why mussels are important, best management practices for dealing with mussels during any construction, restoration, projects, things like that. Um, any, any projects that do any kind of dewatering, removing stabilized features, even if they're not ideal stable features, they might be 
good habitat for mussels at that time and placing structures, um, altering any of the flow or sediment um, and causing any downstream transport of sediment. All those activities are very detrimental to mussels. Mussels need to be considered like way in the, in the beginning part of a project pre-planning so that they can be accounted for and the project can be kind of designed around them in the best case scenario. And again, we're looking for those four features for freshwater mussels. And when you're, when you're dealing with mussels in a, a restoration aspect, you really need to consider a design that hits those four features and that doesn't affect the mussels that are existing on the site. So we recommend avoiding projects that uh, would disturb large populations of mussels, particularly there are very few large dense populations of mussels left in Western North America. And so it's very important to try to avoid impacts to those large populations when we can. If we have to impact mussels in some way, doing the salvage and relocation of mussels to carefully um, chosen areas where we, where we have those four features of mussel habitat, and we can monitor those muscles and make sure that they survive. We can reduce indirect impacts, especially the downstream transport of sediment or um, any changes to the river flow that might affect muscles downstream or on site, and then creating or enhancing habitat for muscles at sites. So where muscles exist, they are identifying habitat that is suitable for them. And then when we remove muscles or we don't have muscles at a site, making sure that those pieces of habitat that are suitable for mussels are incorporated into the project design. So snorkel surveys are the most, um, the most effective way of finding mussels. You can see in this picture um, how glassy the water is on the top there. And it's very difficult to actually see all the way down to the sediment, especially if mussels are burrowed fairly deep, which oftentimes they are, and there might only be just a little slit of a um, an in-current or ex-current siphon that you can see in the surface of the substrate. So snorkeling is the most effective way. You can kind of see how cryptic they look. Sometimes they're covered completely in periphyton. They look exactly like the rock next to them. They can also be buried very deep. They can be next to some stable features, which might be boulders or log jams. Um, they might look very similar to the environment around them. 100% survey is usually what we recommend unless you kind of know what you're looking for. It is very difficult to find mussels and oftentimes multiple sweeps. So, you know, it might be a, a one to three man crew spanning the river looking for mussels um, and then doing that again and again to determine that we've captured all the mussels that we need to if we have to remove them or that we've accounted for all of the individuals if we're doing a population assessment. And eDNA, environmental DNA, which is collecting a water sample from the water, analyzing that for the DNA that's present and looking specifically for mussels is a really good tool because you can cover large areas without having to snorkel for river miles at a time to try to find mussels. So eDNA can kind of give us a snapshot of presence or absence over large geographic areas. And we're really trying to use that um, in the future to try to, try to find mussels um, on a wide area. So again, I said this image is going to come up again. So um, I'll give everybody just a, maybe a second to think in their heads how many freshwater mussels are in this image. Maybe it's more than you think. I'll give you a couple seconds. There's actually, I think there's all three species of mussel in this image. And there are definitely more than you think. There's also a few aquatic insects in this picture. So I'll just highlight circle some of these mussels and you can see if you were guessing the right number. We have one here, two, three, this one's sitting kind of sideways, four, five, six, seven. Hopefully somebody got seven mussels. They're kind of hard to see, but you can see why snorkeling an area would be very important, especially if you have multiple species, some mussels buried deeper than others. Sometimes mussels are in um, layers. So there might be mussels on top of mussels. In order to really see them, you really have to get your head underwater and be in their environment. So what do mussels tell us when they're in the river and they're in healthy populations? So I'll use the Grand Ronde River, for example. There's been a number of habitat restoration projects in the Grand Ronde where mussels have been disturbed or needing salvage. And so in those sites, um, the habitat might not be ideal for salmonids, might not be ideal for a lot of different reasons. And so mussels might need to be moved to improve the river. However, we should really listen to what the mussels are saying and um, observe what we're seeing there. So in the Grand Ronde River, we see 
um, large populations, very dense beds with multiple age classes. You can see a juvenile muscle up here in my hand in the right hand corner. And that tells us muscles are reproductive in that area. So there's obviously um, habitat conditions that support reproduction. There are host fish. So if there are mussels reproducing, there have to be host fish involved. And that stable substrates exist, especially if you see older mussels that have been there many decades. Some of the populations in the Grand Ronde that I'm talking about had mussels from age one to possibly age 80. So for 80 years, those mussels have been reproductive and they've been stationary in those locations with stability. That might not be the most ideal stability, but we can still learn some lessons from those mussels. Um, that also indicating that uh, suitable water quality exists and the food resources exist to carry mussels all the way to age 80 in those, those certain cases. Generally water quality um, requirements and, and acceptable ranges for freshwater mussels align with salmonids and other sensitive aquatic species. So they're, they're particularly sensitive to certain um, pieces of water quality, but generally they're following salmonid ranges. So what do we still not know? Um, a whole lot of things, basically everything. So you saw from our subbasin maps, we have huge gaps in our status and distribution. Uh, we don't know where mussels exist. We don't know how they're doing in certain areas. We um, are moving from research, not, not getting rid of research, but having to move into restoration um, with the information that we do have in order to save mussels before they completely disappear, which in some cases is happening. And so we need to learn things like effective population size. What's the minimum population size that could create a self-sustaining um, population of freshwater mussels? We don't know the full suite of host fish relationships for these mussels, whether any of those specialists can use mussels outside of their chosen um, host fish type and uh, learning the microhabitat requirements, especially for the younger life stages, which will help us identify some of the laboratory rearing methods. And then this year and next year, we're looking into thermal tolerances, which have some implications when we talk about climate change, what's the maximum temperature at which freshwater mussels can survive, especially at the early life stages, which is where we're seeing a, lot, a large amount of mortality in the lab and in the field. Um, we don't know food requirements, those water quality parameters, like I said, the full lifespan of mussels, those Margaret Hiffer, the Western pearl shell, do they truly live to 100? Maybe they live to 200. We don't actually know any of those answers for sure. And so there's a lot of research still to be done. So here's where research meets restoration. With what we know, we kind of go forward. We've created this uh, freshwater mussel master supplementation plan. It outlines supplementation, uh, aquaculture, restoration, conservation, all of these management actions, um, research actions in the laboratory, in the field, um, basically from now until 2069 plus plus. And so the it's a four phase approach. And the first phase is developing laboratory techniques. Second phase is moving those techniques out into the field to test whether the muscles we produced in the laboratory can survive in the wild. Synthesizing in phase three, understanding what worked, what didn't, and how we can kind of adjust that to move forward. And then the fourth phase, which is probably out into 2069 and well beyond, is the full restoration of the seeded area. So producing millions of mussels, putting those strategically in different locations to rebuild populations that have been extirpated or are declining. And um, a phase zero covers our research phase, which is again, those seven different components that are are ongoing, we'll continue that research. This master plan's goal is to evaluate the feasibility of, of certain restoration strategies that we're identifying, which include artificial propagation and outplanting for population supplementation with the goal of producing restoration plans that are specific to C2IR seeded area subbasins. So each of those subbasins that you saw, we'd like to develop a restoration plan specific to the mussels that live in that subbasin and specific to the mussel habitat that exists in that subbasin. So it's a fairly big job, but um, happy to answer any questions that anybody has. And thank you all for um, joining. And thank you, Oregon Wild, for inviting me. Really appreciate it. So I am actually going to give a brief update on something, but um, yeah, good reminder for everybody to stick around for questions and answers, which will be much more interesting than what I'm about to say. So let's quick see if I can get my presentation up here. Let's 
Are you able to see a picture of the Grand Ronde River? Yep. Great. Without uh, all the notes, right? Or the next slide stuff? Yeah, it looks good. Great. Well, yeah, thank you, Alexa. That was really great. Um, even as one of Oregon Wild's sort of resident super fans of uncharismatic uh, microfauna, I learned a lot and really hope I can uh, incorporate some of it into my work. Uh, so I am Oregon Wild's Northeast Oregon field coordinator based just outside of Enterprise, where my wife and I also uh, own and operate a working farm and bed and breakfast. Um, and an incredibly beautiful place. And despite ongoing threats, it continues to have the most complete assemblage of, of native wildlife anywhere in the state. Uh, where I live is uh, home to the Ninipu or Nez Perce tribe. Uh, and it's important to note that not only have they been here since time immemorial, but also that they never gave up their claim to this place. Uh, in fact, actually, the Snake River watershed contains the oldest currently known evidence of human settlement in North America at over 16,000 years. Um, we're excited about some of the tribal efforts here to protect and reconnect the seasonal rounds and support their efforts to return these lands and waterways to a much better condition. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute to talk to you about some of the work that Oregon Wild is doing that we believe can help uh, ensure freshwater mussels continue to be a part of functioning ecosystems and human culture here and, and across the state. So if you've been paying attention to our work over the last few years, uh, you've no doubt heard of the River Democracy Act, and I just want to give a quick update there. Uh, for the uninitiated, the River Democracy Act is a bill that Senator Wyden put forward to protect over four and a half thousand miles of Oregon's waterways as wild and scenic. Uh, a few years ago, the senator put out a call for citizens, tribes, and organizations to recommend uh, rivers, streams, creeks, tributaries, and wetlands that, that deserve protections. Uh, after a series of, of town halls, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and events, um, the senator got over 15,000 nominations and analyzed them. Uh, so in February of last year, uh, Senator Wyden put forward a bill that would protect about 4% of the state's waterways, uh, bringing this, the state total to a modest 6%. Uh, since that time, he's solicited input from across the state, uh, especially here in, in rural Oregon. Uh, not surprisingly, there's been some ideological opposition, primarily based on misinformation and, and willful misunderstanding. Uh, but for better and worse, wild and scenic river protections fall far short of, of wilderness. Unless you want to build another Bonneville Dam, they don't affect private property rights. Uh, it doesn't prohibit logging, grazing, irrigation, firefighting, recreation, or any number of other activities. What a wild and scenic river designation does do is identify the outstandingly remarkable values of a waterway, which could be things like clean water, fish habitat, wildlife, cultural sites, uh, rare plants or scenery, freshwater mussels perhaps, and ensure that the relevant agency uh, creates a, a management plan to protect and enhance them within a half mile of that waterway. To me, uh, Alexa's presentation really reinforced the notion that amidst a worsening climate crisis, increasing development and an often overlooked biodiversity crisis, we need to do a whole lot more, but this is a really great start. And that's why I think the bill has gotten overwhelming support from thousands of citizens, hundreds of businesses, as well as organizations, landowners, and, and tribes. Uh, among the two most outspoken supporters of the bill have been the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla and the Nez Perce. Uh, and in Willowa County alone, when we tried to co compile all of the statements of support last year, it required creating a 65 page document to, re re uh, excuse me, to record them all. Uh, the bill received a positive hearing last summer and is now just awaiting what is called markup before it gets a Senate vote. Uh, the bill will certainly have changed based on some of the constructive feedback the Senator has gotten uh, and that we and others have given him. Um, but unfortunately, the timber industry and some local politicians have continued to put out in misinformation and, and drum up opposition. So we're not taking anything for granted and really need to continue to encourage Senator Wyden to pass it as soon as possible with as many deserving river miles as possible. Um, you know, I think presumably everyone thinks that their part of the state is the most special and they're all probably right. Uh, but I tend to believe that I'm a little bit more right. Uh, and when I look at the map, I am just so thankful that Northeast Oregon is, is really well represented. Um, however, I am kind of noticing a few errors on this map. So if you do go back to this presentation, don't uh, refer to this slide as anything definitive. Uh, you can find a more accurate uh, map on the Senator's website. In any case, uh, Northeast Oregon's Wallow Mountain Range is actually part of the Rocky Mountain ecosystem. And the Blue Mountains uh, provide a connectivity corridor of continental importance. Uh, they are really the only east-west connection points that connect the Rockies to the Cascades, Coast Range, and, and places beyond. 
Uh, the landscapes and waterways that would be protected by Senator Wyden's bill are some of the most important pieces of that puzzle. And well, too often politicians and conservationists overlook places like Eastern Oregon due to these myths about the rural urban divide. The values here are just too important to ignore. And sadly, as we were hearing uh, with things like mussels, they, they are under threat. Uh, and as one example near me, Swamp Creek uh, got its name because it was historically swampy due to beaver dams and healthy meandering watercourses. Uh, it's home to hundreds of historic uh, tribal shellfish middens. Um, and, and despite uh, decades of colonial mismanagement, it remains home to one of the healthiest and most abundant populations of freshwater mussels in the state. Despite that though, a recent Forest Service restoration project uh, called the Lower Joseph Project uh, was supported by the local forest collaborative and sought to restore Swamp Creek by way of logging and road building. Um, they've done nothing there to address fish, pa address fish passage, uh, overgrazing, tribal treaty rights, or ongoing beaver trapping, but rather prioritized logging uh, along the creek. Uh, Swamp Creek was part of the Nez Perce tribal recommendation for the River, uh, excuse me, the River Democracy Act, and is just one of the many that would be uh, designated as a wild and scenic river, ensuring that future management and restoration would protect or, or enhance the values like clean cold water, wildlife habitat, Nez Perce cultural sites, and yes, indeed, mussels. Um, so what to do? Uh, I encourage you to continue to follow these efforts and, uh, and, and our alerts uh, and remind Senator Wyden that we've got his back. Uh, please attend his town halls when they come to you and, and speak up. Uh, tweet at him, write letters to the editor. And if, if you want to do one thing today, um, go to the website I have here uh, and become a citizen co-sponsor of the bill. Um, with that, I just want to be sure uh, to leave enough time for questions and answers and, and want to thank Alexa for your work. Uh, and just actually also encourage you to reach out to me and other Oregon Wild staff whenever we can support your or the tribe's efforts to uh, protect the wildlands, wildlife, and waters uh, in the place that is currently called Oregon. And maybe if it's not too obnoxious, uh, as a first question, I might just wonder if you could provide um, some other suggestions of what folks could do to support your efforts. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Um, I think that probably the best thing that people can do to support freshwater mussels generally is spread the good word that mussels exist. I think I still am um, kind of an, it's an uphill battle getting people to understand that mussels are in rivers, that they are important, that they have a job and um, that they're not, you know, fighting the negative connotation of zebra mussels. These are completely different than zebra mussels. They have huge benefit to the ecosystem like I talked about. So I think awareness is a big thing that I kind of harp on all the time. So just spreading the good muscle word is probably the best thing that you can do. Thanks. Okay, we have so many questions, so I am gonna get started as soon as possible. Um, so the first question is, um, has anyone analyzed muscle tissues for environmental contaminants that may be contributing to to their decline, um, what is known? Yeah, that's a great question. So some of that work's been done in the Midwest and the East. I kind of talked about large number of species. There's quite a few threatened and endangered listed species over there. And so some of that work has been funded over in those areas to identify what specifically is causing those declines to those mussels. That work has not yet been funded um, in any great capacity here in the West, but that's definitely something that the that our muscle project is is working on identifying, um, and that's an area that we can definitely collaborate with other agencies who are out there doing other sampling, and we can identify that. We are kind of hesitant to to lethally sample muscles. Our goal is to you know prevent the death of more muscles and. So we can come up with some creative ways to identify some contaminants that are contributing to those declines. Yeah, and just quickly, could you go over what you think um, or like why mussels are declining? Yeah, that's uh, death by a thousand cuts. So, um, you know, I talked about host fish. Host fish is kind of my game. And so when host fish movement is limited, it really limits the movement of those muscles on the host fish. And that can be um, the cause of some genetic bottlenecking, which might make populations less resilient to changes the, in, in the environment. Muscles are performing the filtration services. And so anything that they're exposed to in the river, which might be pollutants from boats, might be 
pollutants from um, agriculture, all sorts of things those muscles are feeling. We kind of call them the canary in the coal mine. I call them the canary of the canaries because they really are the first ones to feel what's happening in the river system. Um, warm temperatures, loss of water, loss of water quality, um, invasive species, uh, all those things are very detrimental to mussels. Gotcha. And you mentioned temperature. Um, is there kind of an optimal range for mussels and do you monitor the water temperature of the places you're surveying? Yeah, we absolutely do monitor the water temperature. Um, one thing about reproduction of mussels is that it's highly uh, related to the temperature of the river. So mussels become reproductive at certain temperatures, release their larvae at certain temperatures, and the juvenile mussels that are dropping off fish can only survive in certain temperatures. And some of our recent uh, work, we partner with USGS on developing the methods for our, our rearing of mussels in the laboratory. And we've identified some top thresholds for certain species, which are gonna be um, really a, a challenge in the future. Some of those mussels can't survive over 20 to 22 degrees Celsius, which most rivers are, are well over that in the summer months, especially during times of drought. So temperature is a big thing and we're really hunting down the thermal tolerance of the early life stages this year and next year in some of our research aspects. Yeah, definitely very concerning with um, climate change and drought and all that. Um, so this person has been told that there are freshwater mussels in the Willamette River, um, but they have never found one along Corvallis to the Salem area. Um, could you just say a little bit about how you could find mussels and then maybe what you could do if you do find them? Sure, yeah, so one thing I didn't mention, I mentioned a, a partnership with the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Um, they co-manage a Western freshwater mussel database with CTUIR. And so records of all mussels that have been encountered and recorded um, through history and up to current times are being captured in that database. So one way is to contact the Xerces Society. They have a website specific to freshwater mussels you can request a query of the database for specific reasons, and they can help you identify places where mussels might exist. Um, the other thing I recommend is walking the banks and looking for shells that have been discarded by terrestrial animals like muskrats or raccoons. And that'll kind of give you some evidence of maybe a mussel bed inside that location of the river. And then, like I said, snorkeling is really the best way. Uh, we really discourage people from disturbing mussels. Mussels are very sensitive to handling. So if you can just visually look for mussels, um, snorkeling is the best way, sometimes wading, but you want to be very careful to not step on mussels. So that's kind of why we recommend snorkeling. And then if you have any questions about identification of mussels, you can email the Xerces Society, you can take a photo. Um, we have a mussel project on iNaturalist, which you can upload your pictures and then an expert will um, help you identify where that, what that mussel is and it'll be recorded as a, an occurrence in our database. So those are some ways that you can kind of figure out if there's mussels in your area and how to identify what they are. Awesome. Um, and then next question, what do mussels eat? And then related to that, um, what is the actual process of mussels filtering fresh water and extracting pollutants from the water? Yeah, those are good questions. So we, that's still an unknown, to be honest, is what do mussels eat? We're still trying to develop um, kind of best practices for feeding mussels in the laboratory and um, analysis of gut, of gut contents for mussels in the wild has not been done for our Western species, but generally mussels are eating uh, various species of algae, diatoms, bacteria, tiny microorganisms, and the exact process of how mussels are extracting certain pollutants or chemicals or separating foods from other things <clears throat> is not well known to me. Other people might study that specifically and there may be some papers out there on that, but um, that's not an area of my expertise. Gotcha, yeah, there's so many unknowns about mussels. So. Um, so for this next question, could you just talk a little bit more about the parasitic phase of the mussel larvae. Um, what does the larvae do to the fish fin? Do they burrow into the fish to get blood um, for food? And then how long do they stay attached to the fin? Yeah, that's a great question. 
and it kind of varies by species. So we only have one type of fin attaching muscle in the West, that's the anodonta group. And so the fish will swim through the sticky web of glochidia, the larvae. And again, they're about 300 microns, which is like the size of a grain of sand, very tiny. And maybe you know, two to 20 individual larvae might attach to various fins on the fish. And if that fish and that muscle have an evolutionary um, relationship, if that fish can host that muscle larvae, it won't expel the larvae, it won't, it won't drop off the larvae before it's developed. And so it'll actually cover the larvae with a little layer of skin and slime, kind of insist it similar to like if you had a sliver that you weren't aware of and your skin kind of grows over it, might create a little bit of a blister. And then that larvae is, is taking kind of some serum, some plasma, a little bit of blood tissue. But again, it's very tiny. It's on a minuscule scale. And for the anodonta, which are on the fins of the fish, they're on the fins for a period of days, maybe up to two weeks in cold temperatures. For the other species, the two other species, which attach to the gills of the fish, um, again, very few of them. They're even smaller than the fin attaching ones. So they're very hard to see with the naked eye. And they're only taking a small amount of, of um, material from that fish. So it's a very low level of parasitic relationship. And those species might be on the fish a little bit longer. Some of the Western pearl shell um, in very cold areas might be on there for several weeks or even months. And um, so they're, again, just taking a very small amount. And they're on there um, for a, a relatively short amount of time for the lifespan of the fish. Gotcha. And then do we have any idea why certain fish can only serve as host for specific species, or is that another unknown for mussels? I think it's partly an unknown, but it's also partly a product of an evolutionary relationship that those mussel species and the fish species evolved together over very long periods of time. Um, mussels are kind of an ancient animal group, and so some of those fish species just evolved for that level of parasitism. Um, from those freshwater mussels. And that's why we see organisms um, like the Western pearl shell, which are specialists on salmonids. That particular mussel prefers and historically lived in upper areas of watersheds. And so many of the fish that could make it up there were salmonid type fishes. And so that's probably a product of um, that evolutionary relationship over time. And the reason that that mussel is now a specialist on those fish that can migrate long distances and go to those upper reaches of rivers. Gotcha. Fascinating. Um, we still have quite a few questions, so I'm going to extend the Q&A by just a little bit, if that's okay. Um, so we have a question kind of about um, mussels and how they fare when they're actually moved from a location um, to another. Do they thrive? What have you seen so far? Yeah, that's really kind of a sad state of affairs because um, you know, I said many times mussels are sedentary, they're living in areas for decades, they're designed to not move. And so when we move mussels, which we have to, like I said, in restoration projects, when mussels might be directly or indirectly impacted by construction or sedimentation or moving structures, um, when that happens and we have to move mussels, we see 50 to 80% mortality, up to 100% mortality for mussels that we move. Part of that is, is one of the pieces I hit on what is unknown about mussels is microhabitat features that we don't yet know. Um, what are they truly taking in from the, the, you know, the, the poor water between particles of sediment? Um, what is specific to that very, very tiny location where that mussel may have lived for 80 or 100 years in the case of the Western pearl shell? And so we don't truly understand that, but we are starting to when we see large large mortality events from mussels that we have to move for various reasons. But we're, we're trying to use, you know, if you can use the death of an organism to learn something, I think that there's definitely something to be gained there. So when we move mussels, if we have to, we really try to tag them, monitor them, do it in a strategic way where we can understand if they die, what has happened, what not to do in the future so that we can do it better maybe hit that 50% mortality instead of the 90% mortality when we move muscles. So that's kind of why we recommend not moving muscles, not handling muscles if you're not sure what you're doing. Um, part of that reason is you can put muscles upside down. So they have a, a bottom end and a top end. The top end sucks in water and the bottom end has the foot. 
And if you put them upside down, they don't have a way to right themselves. And so oftentimes for inexperienced handlers, that will happen when they move a muscle. So we recommend if you're not, if you're not conducting a, um, a specific experiment that you don't move or handle muscles because they really can be very disturbed by that. And I will also add that their reproduction can be affected by movement or handling, that muscles will abort their larvae if they're, even if they're fully formed, sometimes they'll reabsorb larvae if they're not fully formed. And so they will not reproduce that year if they are handled in certain cases, especially when it's hot or if they're already stressed for other reasons. Muscles are, are fairly sensitive for looking like a little rock. Gotcha. Um, and then just a quick question because I'm curious, do beaver create good habitat for mussels? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's definitely an aspect that's not been well studied and something that I'm, I'm particularly interested in. Um, for the Gonidia angulata, the western ridged mussel, we've observed them in um, deeper pools and associated with deeper pools, which are oftentimes created by beavers. And so I think there's definitely an association with that. You know, if we think back to the four features of good mussel habitat, stability, beaver ponds can create some stability with some um, woody debris, the complexity, trapping nutrients and food items there. Um, burrowing materials, beaver ponds are often collecting some sediment, which might be good burrowing materials for certain species of mussel, and creating habitat for their host fish to live and find refuge. So mussels probably have an association with beaver ponds. I think that's very understudied, and it sounds like a good master's thesis for somebody. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. I would love to <laughs> All right, I just have one more question for you, but it's like a three-part question. So I'll take the whole thing, and if you want me to repeat it um, or parts of it, that's fine. So what is the status of the ESA listing? When do you expect a decision? And what might be, one second. What is the status of the ESA listing? When do you expect a decision? And what might we have to do differently to ensure they recover? Oh boy. <clears throat> um... So the ESA listing is in the species status assessment period. And so it's information gathering by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and CTYR has a ton of data on the Ganidia angulata, the Western ridged mussel. And so we're participating pretty heavily in that process. I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of meetings in the future to discuss what we know about the Western ridged mussel and how we can use that. I, I'm not super privy to the timeline of this process, um, but I imagine that we won't have a result in 2022, but potentially some kind of process in 2023. Um, and then uh, something about recovery, what, what we can use from that to, um, to push forward recovery, was that the last part of the question? Yeah, so the last part is what might we have to do differently to ensure they recover? Yeah, so I think I think a main thing is protecting mussels where they exist, using those what we call stronghold populations of mussels that are fairly healthy that seem to be reproductive. Try to study those more to understand why they're existing there, why they're persisting there. And then areas where we might identify good mussel habitat using artificial propagation and outplanting of propagated mussels in those maybe good areas of habitat to try to recreate populations. But this is a continual adaptive management process where we do an action, we really closely study the results of that action, we reform how we do those actions, and then we do those again in various locations so that we can really truly understand that. Mussels are very individualistic in their streams. They kind of like certain habitats because um, populations have, have grown and persisted in these specific areas for decades, centuries, really long periods of time. And so I think we have to listen to the mussels a little bit better, where mussels persist. We have to understand why they persist, where, they, where we think they might be good, uh, you know, where we think there might be good mussel habitat and there should be mussels, we need to understand why mussels don't exist there. And a lot of times it's because they were extirpated from, um, you know, rote owning the river or they were removed for whatever reason, um, or they were affected by upstream activities or agriculture pollutants or something like that. If we can identify what's going well at places where mussels are existing, persisting and doing well, 
and then use that information to try to um, place muscles back strategically where we think they might be um, the most successful long-term. Because muscle restoration is not on a four-year, six-year, 10-year cycle. Muscle restoration is on a 100, 200, 300-year cycle. We have generation lengths that are almost 50 years. It's going to be well beyond my career that somebody has to take this over and take ownership and responsibility for the muscles that exist and protecting them, restoring them where we can, and identifying what is working and what's not. Wow, great. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom. And that was super fascinating. Um, I would just want to be mindful of your time. So I'm going to have to close the Q&A now. But yeah, thank you so much, Alexa. Thank you, Rob. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.